So let's get right to it with Burke Magnus, president of content uh, for ESPN. As you see, Burke has his red eye coffee uh, after the Jets 49ers game last night, and he's uh, ready to go. Burke, uh, give us uh, your review of last night's first Monday Night Football game. Monday Night Football game is coming off its most watched season ever on ESPN. Yeah. You've got Troy and Joe in the booth, and you've got Jason Kelsey making his debut last night. Tell us what you thought. Well, listen, I, I've never felt better about where we are from a talent perspective on NFL than right now. I mean, um, uh, I think it was Jimmy Tra Traina. Sorry, sorry to bring up the competition. <laughs> Jimmy Traina tweeted last night that Joe Buck and Troy Aikman are not only the best doing it, they're the best by a wide margin. And right. I really believe that. And we're so fortunate to have them documenting the game from the booth. I, I really believe that that's brought a stability and you know a credibility to our NFL coverage that you know frankly was missing there for years after as we were trying to um, you know get to a place where the booth was solid again, but not just those guys because they're you know they're the best. Um, but you know it's year two of Scott Van Pelt on Monday Night Countdown. We added Jason Kelsey to the mix. He kind of gave us right out of the shoot exactly what we were hoping right. for last night. He's fun and he's funny, and he's casual and he's himself and he jokes. But then when you Let's really hone in on a point he's making. You know, the guy's a seven-time Pro Bowl center who's going straight to the Hall of Fame, and he knows the game of football inside and out, and he's still very attached to it. Um, and he was really, you know, interested and intrigued with our proposal to involve him in our coverage because we travel, you know, Monday Night Countdown to, yeah. to, to site every week, um, with the exception of those few doubleheader weeks we have. So... You know, Scott with Ryan Clark and Marcus Spears and Kelsey, rock solid pregame show. We had NFL Live there, Laura Rutledge hosting that with her cast. Um, you know, and uh, so dialing back to Sunday, it was Mike Greenberg's first uh, episode at the helm of Sunday Countdown. So, right. Which was, you know, I think pretty fortuitous uh, in that we had some real breaking news during that. You know that that window, which you know is Greeny's wheelhouse. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I was very, I'm very pleased with where we are right now. Yeah. yeah, Kelsey brings sort of an everyman quality. Yeah. I think if you didn't see the show last night, I think he lost his luggage, so he had to go to the store and get a shirt. Uh, he's not an off the rack guy. No, he's not. You know, like it just wasn't. You know, <laughs> I could do that. He can't right. do that. It was a little snug. Yeah. Right. He yeah. can't just go to TJ Maxx and buy a shirt. No, right? no, no. <laughs> but uh, he, you know, he, he's. Uh, he brings a level of, of, uh, of like fun to the, and that's really what we're after. You know, sports is supposed to be fun. Yeah. You know, yeah, there's lots of um, information that needs to be communicated. There's lots of analysis. There's occasional breaking news stories that have to be covered that are serious. But for the most part, we're there to have fun and celebrate the game, and, and, and hopefully um, that comes through. Yeah. You mentioned Mike Greenberg. Uh, Mike Greenberg took over the Sunday NFL Countdown host chair that was held so long by Chris Berman. And to me, uh, I wrote that I, I thought he was the perfect choice because I think he's the best interviewer host who gets the most out of his guests. And as you said, you know, he walks into this Tyree Kill situation yeah. and it's breaking news. Did that play to his strings? Because now he doesn't have to worry about it. He just does what he's done a thousand times, which is cover a breaking news story. Yeah, and that happened in the first hour, right? I mean, it was so, it was, you know, obviously um, Tyreek was on the way to the stadium, so it was very early in the day, uh, pregame. Um, and yeah, I, I think, you know, I was, I was texting Jimmy Patero, my boss, and I said, I mean, thank goodness we have him right now because it was, it was, it was masterful when you consider that this was his li first time on the show, first time with that cast. Right. Um, you saw his sort of core competency come out immediately. And you're right, he's a great, you know, traffic cop. He, he hones in on what people are saying. He builds on what people are saying. Um, and it was just the perfect scenario for him. And by the way, I think it made him very comfortable right out of the shoot, too, because that felt like, you know, Okay, I know what I know what I'm doing. Here, right, right. He didn't tell me that, but I I, fe I felt like you know you could vis you could visibly see him become more comfortable, um, and it's only going to get better. Yeah. You know? He's the kind of guy, by the way. Like I sent him a text and I said, "Hey, great for a show. You handled that beautifully." You know, a couple other examples I gave him. He's like, "Well, we're nowhere near a finished product." Right. Like I know. I'm just saying, good job on the first episode. 
and, uh, and, and he's, uh, so he's a perfectionist, he, and I, I have no doubt it's going to continue to just get better and better. Yeah. As we saw on Sunday with the Tyreek Hill story, uh, ESPN was the first out of the gate with coverage from Adam Schefter and Jeff Darlington, who did the same thing uh, with the, the Scotty Scheffler story a couple of months ago. Talk about that breaking news focus that you showed that day. Is that, to you, ESPN at its best? Yeah, it, it, it kind of is. I, I, I think we're fairly singular in that regard in the world of sports. I think we're the only entity that it has resources, generally speaking, that are in position to do that if, if such a thing happens. I mean, Jeff Darlington is an interesting you know, coincidence that he happened to be in both places. Yeah. Um, and, and dialing back to the Schefter example, I mean, that happened at 5 in the morning. Think about the fact that, like, we didn't race Jeff Darlington to the golf course. He was already there. Right. And so, you know, he, he's a total pro. Um, you know, he, he takes his job seriously. He's in position. He's smart with his questions. He hustles. All the production resources that we typically have on site allow things like finding Drew Rosenhaus and getting him on the field for an interview you know, as quickly as possible can yeah. happen. And I just think we're the only ones that are, that are set up to do that kind of thing and, and do it around a big event too, right? I mean, the thing that gets lost in the Scheffler example is that that very same day, as that story developed from five in the morning until you know, there was a delayed, a weather delay and, and, and golf didn't start until afternoon, but we still then did you know, uh, six hours or seven hours of a, of a major golf tournament. Right. Um, so, you know, we're producing uh, major events, we're covering news, we're, we're jumbling it all together if need be, if something happens, like either of those circumstances. So it was a pretty proud day for us in both, in both cases. Yeah. Does Darlington have some police scanner that we don't know about? He <laughs> seems to be the dirty Harry of uh, yeah. reporters when it, it comes to athlete arrests. No, no, nothing, nothing uh, that I'm aware of <laughs> anyway. But uh, yeah, he just happened to be in the right place in both circumstances. And, and both were very, very, you know, unique circumstances. Um, but no, he, he's, just a, he's just a great reporter who, who hustles, you know, who knows, you know, how to write and how to, you know, how to talk on camera and right. he, his presence is, is solid. He know he's versatile, you know, obviously one was golf, one was NFL. So he's, uh, he, he's just a valuable guy and, and we love having him. Yeah. Um, as you saw last night was the first night of a uh, Monday night football. ESPN has a massive football schedule this season, uh, Monday night football, uh, and obviously the SEC on ABC, you know, we've been waiting for that, uh, for a long time. Uh, and well, as well as, extending with the college football playoff. Yeah. So tell us your outlook on what we should look for, what we can expect from ESPN's pro and college football coverage this fall. Well, we talked about NFL and, and um, you know, I'm, we're, we're gonna continue to do, you know, um, and run sort of the same play, but the talent has changed and we've, we've continued to upgrade that and, and that's always gonna be a focus. Um, the playbook's going to be pretty similar relative to, you know, some ABC and ESPN simulcasts. We've got the Manning casts 11 times, speaking of a talent upgrade, Bill Belichick right. all 11 times. Um, that being on site last night, that was one thing I just had, I didn't get a chance to see. Uh, I had a lot of people texting me and, and I was sort of monitoring social on it. So I think, I think Bill got off to a good start. I mean, who, who would have thought? But uh, he, you know, he's got obviously got a huge brain relative to, to football, his PhD level, as I said in, in yep. Bristol the other day, um, and you know he's comfortable with those two guys, uh, and so you know so much of what we do is just how what's the chemistry between the people on air, and and he's very comfortable with Peyton and Eli, so I think there's going to be great things out of that show. On the college side, listen, you mentioned it. You know, this is after having done that deal, I think almost three years ago. Right, we've been waiting forever. Yeah, it, we, we finally got to roll out, um, you know, a totally exclusive relationship with the Southeastern Conference um, with, you know, sort of the signature element being the new SEC on ABC 330 window, which for you scheduling nerds out there like myself, um, we're not gonna do it exactly the same way as CBS did. The fact that CBS was in the midst of it all for years and years, there was really a draft of games and they typically 
uh, had the first pick every week, and they put it, again, typically at 3.30. They had a couple primetime access games, but um, you know, we're, we're going to do something similar, but we're not going to be sort of beholden to a draft. One of the things that the SEC really responded to when we were pitching them was flexibility for their teams from a, a scheduling perspective. Right. You know, so that they didn't end up early too many times, so they didn't end up late too many times. So, and in that conference with 16 teams with Texas and Oklahoma joining, you know, it's just an embarrassment of riches. You don't really, like, I, you know, there's many, many weeks where you can't say, okay, that's the A game. Yeah. There's an A game, there's an A minus game, there's an A plus game, there's a B plus game. Like, so, you know, we're gonna schedule it uh, across the day uh, including on several occasions, this coming Saturday being one, where we go three wide on ABC and have three straight eight, you know, SEC games at noon, 3.30, and primetime. Right. Um, and we're going to balance the, you know, the, the, the best games, the best inventory between primetime and 3.30 on ABC. Yeah. Um, so r really excited about that. It's come out of the shoot great. Um, you know, on, on the first week, we had the top six games in the sport across any network. Um, and so we're really optimistic. I mean, that, that is a, a powerhouse conference that we have all to ourselves and can kind of, you know, enjoy, you know, the, the everything that comes with that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this year, uh, ESPN hired two of the greatest coaches of all time. Obviously, Bill Belichick is appearing on the Manning cast. He appeared last night. Nick Saban is on college game day. To me, one of the big surprises of this season has been how comfortable and at ease these two irascible, grumpy old coaches <laughs> have been. You know, we, we saw Belichick, I'm on to Cincinnati. We saw uh, Saban get out of my face. <laughs> what happened, Burke? Rat poison, right? right. He called uh, one question yeah. uh, uh, famously from the, the podium. But um, it's a great question. I mean, listen, I, 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 I kind of grew up on the college side uh, of the business at ESPN. So I've known Coach Saban for, for many, many years. And we had had him on enough you know, over the years. I mean, think about the number of times College Game Day found itself in Tuscaloosa at Alabama. And he was always smart enough to make sure that he came out for a segment on the set, even when he was coaching the team. And then on the rare occasions that he wasn't deep into the college football playoff or, or maybe just not in the championship game, we would get him to be on the set you know, uh, at our coverage of the CFP. Right. And even then we knew, you know, because of how guarded and how reserved he had to be as an active coach, we weren't going to get 100% of his personality. Um, we knew he was going to be, he was going to be good. Um, you know, and, and, you know, we, we have a, you know, we have a, 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 a succession planning, a circumstance with Coach Corso, who, by the way, like has a seat on college game day for as long as he would like it, um, you know, uh, and Nick was very, you know, very uh, concerned that, you know, he wasn't replacing Lee Corso. Yeah. But we knew that um, he was going to be good, and he, we knew based on the relationship he had with Kirk Herbstreit in particular and now Pat McAfee um, that he would be comfortable enough to really let himself, you know, go. Yeah. And, so we've been extremely pleased with the results from from Coach Saban. You know, Belichick's taken a, a different route. I mean, he really is. He 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 didn't, and I think his instincts were correct here potentially. He didn't really have an interest in doing a full time gig in a traditional studio setting. Yeah. Nor did he want to call games as an analyst, right? And I don't necessarily think that plays to his strengths. So, so I think that was good instincts. And so he got into a couple environments. Um, two of them with us, with you know a regular spot on McAfee's show, and then also eleven Manning casts. Plus, we're doing you know a, a, an original series with him, where Peyton and Bill break down uh, or look ahead to the coming Monday night uh, football game called Breakdown. Um, that you know, and if you those of you who may remember a show we did in the early days of ESPN Plus called Kobe uh, Kobe Bryant Detail. It's sort of a PhD level analysis of football looking ahead to the coming games that we can air as an episode on ESPN Plus and we can also splice up and put on Sports Center and on right. Countdown and NFL Live and, and stuff. So we're, we're thrilled. We have him in these three different ways, actually. Uh, and I think he's going to be very, very good. But he has also been very open about, you know, hoping to coach again, yeah. wanting to coach again. And, uh, and so, you know, what, what he's committed to do 
uh, for us and others that really allows for that possibility. Yeah. Well, as a Giant fan, I always wished he had stayed <laughs> with the Giants uh, after Parcells. You, you, you and I share that misery right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How many Super Bowls would we have won? But, you know, uh, that's another story. All this that ESPN is doing in football is leading up to one big event, their first Super Bowl. ESPN has always wanted a Super Bowl. The last Super Bowl that was on ABC was under the old ABC Sports. So in 2027, ESPN will televise its first Super Bowl. Tell us about it. Yeah, so we had Super Bowl 40, if you recall, in yes. Detroit on ABC. I, I was I was around. I just I wasn't. I was there. I was not involved. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, but yeah, it's so much time has gone past, and yeah, and that was kind of the old ABC Sports construct. Um, uh, which no longer re exists, uh, and and you know so this really feels like a remarkable opportunity for us. We intend over the next we have about two and a half years, um, you know, before February fourteenth, twenty twenty seven. Not that it's already imprinted right. in my brain. Valentine's Day. By the way, Day. Valentine's yeah. Day. So. <laughs> How about that coincidence? Nice but, gift to ESPN. Yeah, yeah. Um, in LA, so we know where it's going to be. Um, as part of the the, the overall uh, reorganization of our content team that, that we recently announced, um, we also de determined that we wanted to have a full-time position uh, that's dedicated to just sort of project managing the Super Bowl for us, right? Because the, even the people who work on NFL at ESPN you know, they're, they're very busy and oftentimes they do other things as well. So seasonally they work on other sports. You know, it was very, very important to me that we had a, a, a person and a small team of people built around this leader who, um, you know, who are fully dedicated, as I like to say, get out of bed every morning thinking right. about that Super Bowl and only that uh, so that they can keep everything moving in that direction. Because really what we want to do is bring everything that the Walt Disney Company, ESPN, ABC, et cetera, have and bring it all to, to coverage of that game. We want to redefine, you know, what covering a Super Bowl looks like. Yeah. And we have, in many ways, the luxury of not having sort of an imprint on people's mind of what that might look like because we haven't ever been there. The game itself will be on ESPN and right. ABC. Um, no doubt we'll do some version of the of a mega cast, if you will, but it's much more beyond that. You know, it's it's everything leading up to the game. It's it's you know it's coverage uh, in that has our stamp on it, and it, I'm excited to see where it goes over the next two and a half years as it develops. But yeah. you know, we have that one, and then we have another one in 2031. Yeah. Uh, during recent media day in ESPN, you said. ESPN wants to cover the Super Bowl like it's never been covered before. Yeah. Does that mean we're going to see a Manning cast? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, <laughs> if we didn't, I, I think we'd, I'd have a problem with those two <laughs> fellas. But uh, yeah, that, that's going to be definitely a part of it. Um, you know, what I'm focused on is 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 um, the week leading up, right? right. Um, you know, the other networks um, certainly do you know a tremendous job with the game, with game day. Oftentimes, with you know the day or two before, we're looking at it from sort of the moment that the championship games are over until you know probably the day or two after yeah. the Super Bowl itself is over, right? As as a massive window, right? I think somebody on my team calculated how many hours that is, and it's right. kind of like, hmm, could we have like a you know a thousand hour pregame show or whatever the. <laughs> The, the case may be. I, the red eye will prevent me from doing that <laughs> math right now, for sure. But, you know, like, we're really looking at that, the entire window of time, you know, leading, you know, leading into the game from, yeah. from Championship Sunday. I, I was going to ask you, uh, last year the pregame show for uh, the Super Bowl was seven hours. What would you say would be the over and under on ESPN's uh, <laughs> Over seven. seven. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, seven days. Yeah, so that's a good one. Yeah, seven days. Do you see yourself doing uh, the mega cast approach similar to what you do for the college football championship, where you have a dozen different ways to yeah. watch the Super Bowl? Yeah, I, th I think there'll be elements of that. We, you know, we've been in the mega cast business now for a while. Hard to hard to fathom. Like it kind of feels um, comfortable and normal to us to yeah. execute that way. And but I, we don't want to just do that. Like like there's I'm convinced there's ideas out there that are innovative and different that appeal to different audience segments. 
you know, that, that, that haven't even been contemplated yet that we really want to add to everything that, we, that you're used to seeing, right? Yeah. Will there, on digital, our digital feeds, will they include, you know, Skycam and Pylon Cam and Coaches and Star Watch and all this other stuff that we've done with, uh, with the CFP? For sure. Yeah. But, but, um, but what exists beyond that and, and how can we bring the full weight of Disney to bear on this event? You know, the fact that it's in L.A. is fabulous, right? I'm, I'm sure there'll be some connection to, uh, to Disneyland at some level. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm sure there'll be a kid's element uh, uh, for sure. Um, but that's these are, these are just scratching the surface. Yeah. We really want to get in there and figure out, okay, you know, and, and at the end of the day have, you know, a bunch of stuff that's never been done before that, pe that could you know, sort of reset fan expectations yeah. going forward. Yeah, I know your partners at Disney were thrilled with the whole Toy Story. Uh, yeah, that was pretty cool. Mega cast, so uh, that would uh, be one way to go. And uh, by the way, if you're interested in applying for this Super Bowl job, it is VP of the Super Bowl, which is a pretty cool... Uh, title. Pretty cool job title, yeah. <laughs> I think you'll get a few resumes at rink, uh, LinkedIn on that. Yes, for sure. <laughs> Let's switch over to uh, talent. Uh, when we were up in Bristol, we asked uh, Jimmy Pitaro about the state of e uh, Stephen A's contract negotiations. Yeah. He said ESPN wants to stay in business with Stephen A. He's a needle mover. He's a star. What can you tell us? Well, first of all, I rarely disagree with my boss, and I will <laughs> not do it on this one either. Um, he, he's absolutely right. Like, Stephen A is a is a bona fide superstar. Um, he's so versatile. He's so hardworking. You know, he brings you know a built-in audience that's very very loyal. He's created um, you know a real juggernaut in in uh, first take. You know, you you guys had uh, you know he 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 gave you his assessment of the competition. Yes. Uh, over the years. Annihilation. But, yeah, anni total annihilation. Yes. I think he said, but but um, but yeah, he he's. He's a great, great um, uh, talent. He's a he's a he's a superstar by any definition. He's a he's a wonderful person, and 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 we're really fond of saying because this is absolutely true. Nobody works harder than this guy. Like nobody. Like he's he's he he's always on. Whether it's first take the show or whether it's his own activities on social, whether it's his appearances on other shows like NBA Countdown, whether he just pops up on SportsCenter, whether he literally walks in. On Greeny, sometimes we get up and all of a sudden we have like you know he's on that show. So uh, he's got his own podcast. He's got his own uh, his other activities that he's you know he's continuing to delve into. You know he's made his aspirations uh, very clear and and frankly he he should he deserves it. He's a very creative and very talented person that you know we hope to be in business with for a really long time. Yeah, he told us he grew up idolizing Howard Cosell, Hollis Queens, and yeah. that he would like to contribute to Monday Night Countdown in some yeah. uh, capacity. Do you see that happening? Yeah, he he's made that he's made that um, uh, clear as well. And and you know where I sit on that is, and and you can see this already developing. You know, the philosophy that we put our biggest names and our biggest talent on our biggest properties and biggest shows is really, to me, a, a recipe for success, yeah. right? Um, that's what was behind, you know, Scott Van Pelt joining Monday night. That's what's behind Greeny on, on Sunday. You know, the, there's nothing more important to us than the NFL and, and all of the content that surrounds not just Monday night football, but, you know, the NFL in, in totality. You know, we have a huge digital business, a social business, fantasy business, like, NFL content is at the absolute top of the heap. Yeah. And so why wouldn't we want our best people and our biggest personalities working on that? He's certainly well-versed. You know, he certainly knows the game. He certainly knows how to get to the, the stars and have conversations with them. He just had Jerry Jones on his own podcast, which was a fascinating uh, discussion. And he just riles up fans, too. Yeah. So he gets people excited and energized about it. So, you know, um, that to me is a logical conclusion. Um, obviously, we're set for this season, and we're in the we're in the process of 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 discussing uh, his our future relationship with him. So, yeah. it, it makes total sense to me, and I'm sure that'll be part of the conversation. Yeah, uh, in Bristol, uh, Jimmy called the, your weekday daytime lineup a murderer's row. Yeah. You know, you got Get Up, you got First Take, then you got Pat McAfee. Right. Except McAfee's a little different. If you don't know, McAfee doesn't directly work for ESPN except for his college game day. He actually licenses a show. 
And as we all know, Pat has been involved in some yeah. controversial situations. How do you manage and give feedback to McAfee? Well, let me start with the murderer's row for, part first, because you know I actually start with the 7 a.m. Sports Center, which you know which recaps everything from the previous night, leads into Get Up, which right. is much more conversational. So 7 a.m. Sports Center, Get Up, first take McAfee, another Sports Center, two to three, then we're into NBA Today, NFL Live, and then. Uh, uh, around the horn in PTI, PTI yeah. Yeah, into six o'clock, right? So all of a sudden we're, we've gone 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. I, I love every aspect of that, and I think, and it's per, and each one of those things is performing incredibly, incredibly well. Pat's different on a couple different levels, right? In that, yes, you notice we, you, you, you did note that we do license his show. He actually put it in a way that I had never, I had never thought of when we were in Bristol last week or the other week, which was, it's like. It's, it's no different than how we license games from leagues, right? right? Um, and, and that's an interesting way to, to think about it, right? So he fully produces his show um, in Indianapolis with his team and his crew. You know, we, we obviously have people involved, you know, in, uh, from, from the aspect of oversight and, you know, delivery and technical back end and everything else. But it's his show, right? And, and uh, you know, and then the other way it's different primarily is that we distribute it differently than we than we would for many other shows or that we do for many other shows and that it airs on linear it also simultaneously airs on ESPN plus it airs on Pat's YouTube channel and ESPN's YouTube channel and we have a single sale across that entire ecosystem so you know despite the fact that there's there's people out there who don't either accept or appreciate you know the aggregation of total audience around that kind of distribution model, I really believe that's in many ways where we're, where we're headed and right. where the industry is headed. And, you know, an eyeball is an eyeball is an eyeball. And if you can monetize across platforms by aggregating audience um, through various platforms, we live in a multi-platform world. It, it stands to reason that, 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 that things would head in that direction. Yeah. And Pat's just ahead of the curve because, frankly, he developed his show um, creatively and technically on his own, outside of ESPN. We had nothing to do with it, right? We take no credit for the success he, you know, he has realized. You know, we just thought that it would be a good fit with our lineup and it would be um, uh, a relationship that we would be willing to accept. Right. So yeah, he, and he, he, has, he has done some things and said some things that, re that required um, you know, us to have conversations. It's a very productive, uh, uh, relationship that he has with myself, with Jimmy, this guy named Mike Foss, who you know, yep. who, who essentially runs the show. Um, Pat is extremely open to, you know, he never once has he been like, you know, despite the construct of the relationship, I don't want to talk to you guys, leave me alone. Right. You know, this is, this is what you signed up for. You it's never been any of that. It's always been like, how can I get better? You know, he appreciates the, the megaphone that ESPN provides to, to him and to his his aspirations and his business, um, you know, so he, he, uh, he's very open to that. But, you know, it's a, it's a situation, it's different for us, right? It's different in many, many ways, so it requires a different level of oversight and management. Yeah. But we have a willing partner on the other side, and yeah. Pat's, a, Pat's an incredible talent. Yeah. Let's end with the biggest soap opera of the year, uh, which was the NBA rights negotiations. Yeah. Uh, every time we in the media reported that it was done, they went on another two months. So congratulations on extending your deal with the NBA and yeah. also maintaining uh, exclusive, exclusive rights to the NBA final. Right now, you have uh, Doris and Mike yeah. as your number one team. Do you see going forward into the next season keeping a two-person booth, or do you see adding a third analyst like you did last year? You know, it's a really interesting um, moment because um, I don't know that we're going to answer that question immediately. Um, you know, the, the, this coming season is the final year of the old deals, right? So Turner, despite however that situation resolves itself, is going, still has this coming season to, you know, that produce and distribute NBA games yeah. on TNT, which means that every talent that they have, generally speaking, ends a year from now, not now, right? right? So, you know, w w you know, what we realized as we started exploring um, this situation is that um, you, we don't necessarily have to, like, decide any of those things immediately, right? 
two person versus three person, you know, who that, if a third person, who that person is, is yeah. do you bring in somebody from the outside or would you use people for, that we already have under contract? Um, and what people don't realize, and I think we, we are guilty of this because we, you know, we sort of latched on to the, to the nomenclature of like, this is the A team and this right. is the B team. And really that's not what happens during the regular season anyway, right? We mix and match. There's plenty of games where Breen is doing a game with Doris by herself or did a game with JJ or Doc by himself. You know, sometimes it's the three of them. It's more of an NFL construct. It is, it yeah. really is. And so, you know, we're actively talking about it. I, I'm not sure what, where we're gonna end up there, um, but I do know this, speaking of, uh, you know, operating from a position of strength. We have the best NBA play-by-play -play voice by far, right? Mike Breen is rock solid. Like three, I think, Emmys in a row for play-by-play -play in, that, in that cat. Think of all yeah. the people that could be, that are nominated in the play-by-play -play category for the Emmys. Mike is the absolute best. And so we have that foundation and I think we're gonna take our time and figure out you know, exactly who fits best and, and who creates the best experience for fans. In a perfect world, could you see Charles Barkley uh, with ESPN. Yeah, yeah. That would be a perfect world, <laughs> actually. Um, no, I, like, uh, Charles is a singular talent. Um, you know, again, I think this season is going to be a little bit of a bridge to the future, both for us and for the, you know, the NBA and for, uh, for Turner and, and, and NBC getting into the, into the mix and Amazon getting into the mix going forward. So, um, you know, I, I, I would be lying if, we, if I said we weren't interested in Charles. I think the entire industry is interested in Charles. Um, he's really that special. Yeah. Um, so we'll see. I don't know. I, I just keep reassuring people that, you know, if you come work for us, that doesn't mean you have to, like this narrative that got started that says, you know, if you come work for us, you also have to do 200 episodes of First Take or Get Up. No, no, no. The no. car wash. The car wash, no. The car wash is for people who want their car washed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you don't, then you don't have to. Um, you know, this was part of the conversation we had with Jason Kelsey. You know, somebody had put it in his head that he was going to have to, you know, you know, work 200 things a year for us. And I said, no, we would like you for this show. If you want to do more stuff, that's fine. Yeah. But but we want you for Monday Night Countdown. And we've seen that with Aikman and Buck. You know, oh, when, sure. when they appear on a Get Up or something, it's by their choice. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So. Yeah, long-winded long way of saying Charles would be uh, a great addition, but uh, there's a lot of things to resolve before that. Well, Burke, thank you for your time, and please yeah. give it up for thank you. First Magnus. Thank you. Thank you.